Good evening. On behalf of the Simon Perry Center for Constitutional Democracy and the College of Liberal Arts, I'm delighted to welcome you to our last lecture this academic year in the Amicus Curi Lecture Series. We have been absolutely delighted by the community response to these lectures. We're very happy to see you here. Many of you have been back again and again, and we're very grateful for your support. We're also grateful for the support of the West Virginia Humanities Council, which has provided a grant which makes this series possible. As I think I got almost everyone in the room on your way in, they ask us to have these forms filled out that I've handed you. If you could do that at the end and drop it off on your way out, that would be great. If you didn't get a form, they're out on the table. And if you do so before you leave, I'd appreciate it. Tonight, I am delighted to introduce to you Joyce McConnell, the Dean of the West Virginia University College of Law. It is March, and it is Women's History Month. And Dean McConnell is a particularly appropriate lecture to have come at this time. In thinking about the evolution of women's rights in our country, I'm often taken aback when I think that at the time my grandmother was born, the right to vote was not assured by our Constitution. I'm wearing her 1922 class ring from Marshall University. She has inspired me for my entire life as long as she was alive. She was one of the most brilliant people I ever met and accomplished. And when she was born, there was no assurance that she'd be entitled to go to a ballot box. It blows my mind. Obviously, we've come a long way. Joyce McConnell's the embodiment of that. In a state where we have one law school, and in most places, in West Virginia, just as in most places, we have a bench and bar that's pretty male-dominated, we have a woman who's the dean of WVU's law school. I'm delighted by that, and I'm proud of that as a West Virginian, as a lawyer, and as a woman. Dean McConnell earned her undergraduate degree at the Evergreen State University. She went to law school at Antioch, and later got an LLM from the Georgetown Law Center. She was a teaching fellow at Georgetown, before going to the City University of New York Law School to earn tenure. After that, she was a visiting professor for a year at the University of Maryland Law School. And in 1995, she came to West Virginia University College of Law. She served two terms as the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs. Uh, she also is a full professor there. She's the Thomas R. Goodwin Professor of Law. And in 2008, she became the William Mayer Jr. Dean of the Law School. She teaches real property. And as all West Virginians know here, that's a very important thing in our law, where we're an extractive industry state and mineral rights mean so much to so many people. She teaches first year property law and she teaches about conservation and natural resources. She also teaches counseling, negotiation, uh, and leadership, and she has taught courses on gender and the law. She has published on issues related to the rights of women and to the rights and the welfare of children in diverse families. Uh, she's been a leader on the state level. She's been very active in land use planning and conservation planning. And she's a founding member and has been the president of the West Virginia Land Trust. She's also been a member of the executive committee of the section of women in legal education of the American Association of Law Schools. She's an ABA Foundation Fellow. She was honored by West Virginia University with its Mary Catherine Buswell Award for Outstanding Service to Further Equality of Opportunity for and Achievement of Women. She also received the West Virginia University College of Law Women's Caucus first award uh, for women, for women in the law. Tonight, I am delighted that Dean McConnell has come here to speak with us. And you have no idea what a feat that's been. She has hosted the West Virginia Supreme Court in Morgantown last night and this morning. West Virginia University Law School had its Baker Moot Court competition today. And as the dean of the law school, she was certainly involved in that. 
Nevertheless, she is here and she's going to speak with us about the evolution of women's rights under our Constitution. Please join me in welcoming her to Marshall University. Thank you all so very, very much for having me here. I do want to say that our Baker Cup competition was absolutely fabulous, and Justice Ketchum, Chief Justice Ketchum was there today, and he's with us this evening, and I really appreciate him burning up the road to be with us down here. I also want to say that it was a local Huntington young man who won the competition, Adam Lacasio. So. <laughs> His, his parents are with us this evening. I think everyone says congratulations. My, the title of the program this evening is Remember the Ladies, the History of Women and the Constitution. I want to welcome you to this lecture. I'm delighted and truly honored to be asked to participate in this lecture series and humbled to share this podium with the giants who have preceded me. My presence here today is a testament to the persuasive power of the center's director, Patricia Proctor. When I saw the list of all of those who had spoken before me, I thought certainly she wouldn't want me. And she continued to insist, and I'm delighted that she did. It's, I can tell it's going to be a lovely evening. Chief Justice Ketchum of the West Virginia Supreme Court, as I said, is here. Um, there are other justices, members of the federal and state judiciary, state senators and delegates who might be here. President Kopp, who I'm sure would love to be here, but I haven't seen him yet. Senior administrators, members of the bar, there are many of you. Thank you so much for coming this evening. Faculty, students, staff, and members of the Huntington community and beyond. Thank you for being here this evening to celebrate Women's History Month. I also want to thank the Simon Perry Center for Constitutional Democracy in the College of Liberal Arts under the very fine leadership of Dean David Pittenger. It was his idea to start this lecture series, and I think it is really a wonderful, wonderful opportunity for Marshall and the community. <clears throat> and as I said, I particularly want to thank the director, Patricia Proctor. I really have loved working with you on this. I'm honored to speak today in the company of so many friends on the topic of great importance in Women's History Month, and that is the history of women and the U.S. Constitution. If I can get, there we go. Here's the title, Remember the Ladies. This lecture, series, this lecture traces the 236-year journey of women and the Constitution, starting with Abigail Adams and ending with the current perspective of an individual justice of the United States Supreme Court. The historical story I'm about to tell you has three significant chapters. Chapter one, constitutional neglect and silence. Chapter two, active exclusion. And chapter three, long-term interpretive struggle for rights and equality. Chapter one begins with Abigail Adams with her now famous letter of 1776, the year of the Declaration of Independence. Abigail Adams urged her husband, John Adams, while he served as the Massachusetts representative to the Continental Congress. Later, as you know, he became the second president of the United States. She wrote to him, urged him to remember the ladies. In these three words, she previewed the struggle of the history of women and the Constitution. Abigail and John had a marriage of deep affection. And while she was smart and able, she was a woman of the times and did not participate in public political decision making. But her husband did. So on March 31st, 1776, she wrote, in the new code of laws, I desire you would remember the ladies and be more generous and favorable to them than your ancestors. 
we will not hold ourselves bound by any laws in which we have no voice or representation. And here's a copy of her letter. They entered into a dialogue. He was playfully dismissal in his response, which he wrote on April 14th, 1776. He said, I cannot but laugh. We have been told that our struggle has loosened the bonds of government everywhere, that children and apprentices were disobedient, that schools and colleges were grown turbulent, that Indians slighted their guardians and Negroes grew insolent to their masters. But your letter was the first intimation that another tribe, more numerous and powerful than all the rest, were grown discontented. Depend upon it. We know better than to repeal our masculine systems. Although they are in full force, you know they are little more than theory. We dare not exert our power in its full latitude. We are obliged to go fair and softly. And in practice, you know we are the subjects. We have only the name of masters. And rather than give this up, which would completely subject us to the despotism of the petticoat, I hope General Washington and all of our brave heroes would fight. As you can see, John Adams was making an argument that we continue to hear today. While making light of it by referring to it as the despotism of the petticoat, he was not joking in his position against expanding the franchise beyond propertied white men. He expressed this in a letter on May 26, 1776, to his friend James Sullivan. He wrote, it is dangerous to alter the qualifications of voters. There will be no end of it. New claims will arise. Women will demand a vote. Lads from 12 to 21 will think their rights not enough attended to. And every man who has not a farthing will demand an equal voice with any other in all acts of state. A very famous constitutional historian, Richard Morris, wrote, a prime and still evolving portion of the history of the United States Constitution and a cause for celebration is the story of the extension through amendment, judicial interpretation, and practice of constitutional rights and protections to once ignored or excluded people, to humans who were once held in bondage, to men without property, to the original inhabitants of the land that became the United States, and to women. You can begin to see the pattern of the lack of inclusion or exclusion of women and others from the Constitution. It's always important to remember at the beginning that those who participated in our constitutional democracy were very, very limited to white male property holders. There were provisions, however, the Constitution that did apply to all people. And those were the kinds of individual liberty protections that we think of today, like bills of attainder, searches and seizures, clearly rights of the free individual. But women, other than being protected from things like searches and seizures, were not included in the Constitution. The word he, other than in these very limited circumstances, did not include she. There was also no mention of equal or of equality in the Constitution, drafted in 1787, or in the first 10 amendments, the Bill of Rights, ratified in 1791. Many constitutional historians have speculated about what explains the absence of any reference to equality in the original United States Constitution. They speculate because the, the word equality, the concept of equality, so dominated what was going on during the French Revolution, and certainly our founders were more than familiar with that revolution. 
They speculate that they knew about it in part because of the French Declaration of the Rights of Man, which, de which declared in section one, men are born free and remain free and equal in rights, and law must be the same for all, whether it protects or punishes. To compound the question though, why did the 18th century United States Constitution fail to incorporate the 1776 Declaration of Independence, which declared in ringing tones, and we probably could all say this together in unison, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. What is the answer to the absence of the concept of equality in the Constitution and in the Bill of Rights, given this historical context? A partial and perhaps the most important answer, according to most historians of the period, is the existence of slavery in all but five of the 13 states of the United States when our nation was new. That is part of the actual reason, but the reason is even more encompassing. There's Thomas Jefferson. Concerning women, listen to the words of Thomas Jefferson, principal author of the Declaration of Independence and later our third president. In 1816, Jefferson said, were our state a pure democracy, there would yet be excluded from our deliberations women who to prevent the deprivation of morals and ambiguity of issues should not mix promiscuously in the public meetings of men. Thus, Jefferson had a very keen feeling that the idea or the concept of equality that was embodied in our important founding documents, but not in the Constitution, excluded and should exclude women. Thus, equality was not woven into the constitutional fabric. In fact, it was not until 1868, 81 years after the Constitution was ratified and after the Civil War ended slavery, that the United States Constitution provided in the 14th Amendment, as it has ever since, that no state shall deny to any person the equal protection of the laws. I'm going to go back to this one. This is a slide of Anne Knight, who I'm using as symbolic of women's involvement in campaigns for equality. Because from the founding of the country, if you remember those words of Abigail Adams, remember the ladies, Women were at the forefront of equality movements and particularly at the forefront of the anti-slavery movement. They were leaders in the abolition movement and they truly believed that in fighting slavery and for the freedom of African Americans, they would also win freedom or equality for women. But while the 14th Amendment, this is actually a very interesting slide I wanna pause on for a moment. This is a piece of, of women's work at the time, a quilt, and it has the image of a slave uh, pleading for freedom and for mercy in the center of the quilt. And during the abolition movement, many women made these quilts as ways of publicly um, participating in the abolition movement. And I think that that's a very interesting slide. So at the founding of the country, women were very involved in the anti-slave movement. They were very much the leaders uh, of the abolition movement. But while the um, 14th Amendment granted freedom to all African Americans, men and women, freedom from enslavement, the 15th Amendment, which granted the franchise, granted it only to African American men, thus excluding all women. African American, white, ethnic, from the franchise. So now we begin chapter two, which is the period of actual ac 
active exclusion. Some historians would refer to chapter one as the silence and neglect of women, failing to incorporate them into the Constitution. But now what we see is active exclusion. It took more than 50 years for women to win the right to vote with the ratification of the 19th Amendment. Remember Jefferson's statement about women. It was more than 100 years later that women earned the right to vote. And as you heard uh, Patricia Proctor say, her grandmother was born at a time before she would have known that she would be assured the right to vote. In fact, anyone here today who is more than 92 years old was alive before women could vote. And that is truly extraordinary. In the meantime, the United States Supreme Court began a period of seeking to protect women in keeping with Jefferson's explicit philosophy that women were weak and in need of protection from public life. Most laws that differentiated on the basis of sex did so ostensibly to shield or favor the sex regarded as fairer, but weaker and dependent. Remnants of the common law regime, which denied to married women the rights to hold and manage property, to sue or be sued in their own names, or to get credit from a financial institution, were laws that were designed to save them from their own folly and their own misjudgment. Laws limiting the maximum number of hours or the times of day women could work, or keeping to a minimum the wages they could receive, or ordering that those wages should have to be turned over to a male in the family. Laws barring females from hazardous or, in a, or inappropriate occupations, and that list included lawyering in the 19th century and bartending in the mid 20th century. The head and master rule was, was um, lionized, vesting all property control and decision making to husbands. All of this was premised on the notion that women could not cope with the world beyond hearth and home without a father, husband, or big brother to guide them. Absent a male relative to lean on, the United States Supreme Court said in 1908, a woman would fall prey to the greed as well as the passion of man. Cases of the kind I just described placed a spotlight on the burdensome nature of legislation that confined women to the separate sphere of the home. By enshrining and promoting the woman's natural role as selfless homemaker and correspondingly emphasizing the man's role as provider, the state impeded both men and women from pursuit of the very opportunities and styles of life that could enable them to break away from traditional patterns and develop their full human capacities. But this would not begin to change for another hundred years. Even though women gained the right to vote through hard protest and struggle, Women were still not full citizens. They earned the right to vote in 1920 with the 19th Amendment. They were excluded from jury service on the basis of their sex. This was one of Abigail Adams' concerns, actually, for women in 1776, the idea that women would be convicted of crimes without a jury of their peers. It was almost 200 years after Abigail Adams asked John to remember the ladies. It was not until 1970, 50 years after women earned the right to vote, that all obstacles were removed for women to serve on juries. 1970 was a year before I graduated from high school just to put it in perspective of being um, alive and what it meant to learn that that final obstacle had been removed. With that background in mind, I want to share a Florida case 
that found its way to the United States Supreme Court in 1961 that drives home the significance of the absence of a jury of her peers. In 1957, which was only 55 years ago, Gwendolyn Hoyt stood trial for murdering her husband. Today, we would consider her a victim of domestic violence. She acted in self-defense, hit her husband in the head with her son's broken baseball bat as he attacked her, caused him to fall, hit his head on a hard surface, and he died instantly. When she was tried, Florida placed no women on the jury rolls out of concern for women's place, and this is a quote, at the center of home and family life. To put this in perspective, almost 80 years earlier, in 1880, the West Virginia Supreme Court of Appeals overturned a murder conviction, holding that the exclusion of African American men from the jury was unconstitutional. West Virginia women could not sit on juries until 1956, 76 years later. With the exclusion of women from her jury, Gwendolyn Hoyt was convicted of second degree murder by an all male jury. She appealed to the United States Supreme Court arguing that she was convicted without a jury of her peers. The Supreme Court in 1961 rejected her plea. The court following an unbroken line of precedent used a separate spheres argument the notion that it was man's lot because of his nature to be the breadwinner, the head of household, the representative of the family outside the home, and it was woman's lot because of her nature to bear and raise children, keep the house in order, and certainly not to serve in a public way on a jury. And yet, it was only three years after women won the right to vote in 1920 that the Equal Rights Amendment was introduced, was first introduced in 1923 by Republican Senator Curtis and Representative Anthony. And Representative Anthony was Susan B. Anthony's nephew. So two Republicans, Senator Curtis and Representative Anthony, actually introduced the Equal Rights Amendment for the first time three years after women won the vote. It was authored by Alice Paul, probably a name many of you do not remember. She was the head of the National Women's Party who led the suffrage campaign. The phrase that they used in writing this declaration was the equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. From 1923 to 1972, the amendment was introduced into each session of Congress. And here you see some early slides of protests for the introduction of the amendment. It continues to be introduced, believe it or not. In 1972, it passed both houses. A huge campaign, which I'm sure many of you remember, developed against the Equal Rights Amendment. A decade later, it fell short of ratification by three states. We still do not have the Equal Rights Amendment, although it does continue to be introduced periodically. We now begin chapter three, the long-term interpretive struggle for rights and equality. United States Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall, the champion of desegregation and, and the champion of end to discrimination based on race, said prior to his 1991 retirement that he did not celebrate what the Constitution was in the beginning as originally framed because it protected the slave trade and it required the return of persons who had escaped from human bondage, a provision that was in force until the Civil War. Instead, he said he celebrated how our fundamental instrument of government had evolved over the span of two centuries. The true miracle, he said, is the Constitution's life nurtured through two turbulent centuries. It is this constitutional life that many constitutional scholars believe in. Others suggest that the equal dignity of the individual is part of the United States constitutional legacy shaped by the original framers. 
Yet others argue that there is no overarching theme of equality in the Constitution, and that the, const that, that the Constitution and equality must come through constitutional amendment or congressional action. Some would argue that the culture of the founders impeded their ability to perceive, perceive or act on a quote that I love by Justice Ginsburg. Ideals of human equality and rights and opportunities and of individual freedom to aspire and achieve. She points out that these theorists um, found that the founders stated a commitment in the Declaration of Independence to Equality and in the Declaration and Bill of Rights to Individual Liberty. She says those commitments had growth potential and that they received further expression in the 19th century after the Civil War ended slavery, mostly through the addition of the Equal Protection Clause to the Constitution and again in the 20th century when women were made voting citizens. The period of constitutional interpretation for gender equality and push for constitutional amendment to guarantee gender equality really starts again about 10 years after Brown versus Board of Education in 1954. Board, as you remember, is the case that barred, um, that prohibited discrimination on the basis of race in public education. The vibrant idea of equal stature and dignity of men and women as a matter of constitutional principle actually began to have traction after 1954. At the same time, a very important biotech revolution was happening, and that was the biotech revolution of birth control. For the first time in women's history, women could prevent pregnancy and more easily participate in the workplace and in the public sphere. Generally, two birth control cases hit the United States Supreme Court. In 1965, we have Griswold versus Connecticut. There, the court struck down Connecticut law prohibiting the use of contraceptives by a married couple, finding that it violated the right to marital privacy. While the Bill of Rights does not explicitly mention privacy, Justice William O. Douglas wrote for the majority that the right was to be found in the penumbras and emanations of other constitutional protections. Justice Arthur Goldberg wrote a concurring opinion in which he used the Ninth Amendment to defend the Supreme Court's ruling. And Justice John Marshall Harlan wrote a concurring opinion in which he argued that privacy is protected by the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. Justice Byron Wright also wrote a concurrence based on the Due Process Clause. Two justices, however, Hugo Black and Potter Stewart, filed dissents. Justice Black argued that the right to privacy is to be found nowhere in the Constitution. Justice Stewart famously called the Connecticut statute an uncommonly silly law, but argued that it was constitutional. Seven years later, in 1972, in the case Eisenstadt versus Baird, the right to privacy extended to the use of contraception by unmarried couples. Thus, the right to use birth control is now a mere 40 years old. For some of us, 40 years ago seems like yesterday. For many of us sitting here today, 40 years seems like a long time ago. But in constitutional history, it is recent and perhaps a very fragile right, one that could disappear if current justices adopt the Black and Stewart reasoning in their dissents in Griswold versus Connecticut. Against this social and legal backdrop, the turning point case in sex-based equal protection outside the context of birth control was Reed versus Reed brought by a young lawyer and law professor, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, now United States Supreme Court Justice Ginsburg. The case decided in 1971 involved Richard Lynn, a teenage boy from Idaho who died under tragic circumstances. His parents were long separated, and while he was young, during his tender years, the court awarded his mother, Sally Reed, custody. However, when Richard became a teenager, the court gave custody to his father, Cecil, to prepare Richard for his manhood years. The boy fell in with a bad crowd, 
and spent some time in a corrections facility. When he was released to his father's custody, he was deeply depressed and committed suicide. Using his father's gun, Sally Reed, the mother, sought to take charge of her son's few belongings, applied to the court to be administrator of Richard's estate. The father, some days later, applied for the same appointment. The Idaho court turned down Sally Reed's application, even though she was first in time, and appointed the father under a state statute that read, as between persons equally entitled to administer a decedent's estate, males must be preferred to females. Sally Reed, according to Justice Ginsburg, was not a sophisticated woman. She earned her living by caring for elderly people, taking them into her home. Justice Ginsburg wrote, she probably did not think of herself as a feminist, but she had a strong sense that her state's law was unjust. The Supreme Court unanimously declared Idaho's male preference statute unconstitutional in denying Sally Reed the equal protection of Idaho's law. That was a watershed case. Two years later, in 1973, arising out of the privacy doctrine established in Griswold and extended in Eisenstadt, the court decided perhaps the best, well -known, most well-known case of the last four decades, Roe versus Wade. And it also decided a less recognized equal protection case, Frontiero versus Richardson. In Frontiero, Frontiero versus Richardson, again, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, represented Air Force Lieutenant Sharon Frontiero and successfully challenged as a denial of equal protection the military's policy of denying women housing and medical benefits to cover their husbands. These benefits were automatically granted to men for covering the um, housing and medical benefits of their wives. Lieutenant Frontiero had this clear view. She saw the laws in question as plain denials of equal pay within the military system, and the court agreed. In Roe versus Wade, probably the most well-known and controversial case of the last 50 years, held that the right to privacy under the Due Process Clause in the 14th Amendment extends to a woman's decision to terminate a pregnancy. But that right must be balanced, as we know, against the state's legitimate interests for regulating abortion. And those interests are protecting prenatal life and protecting the woman's health. Saying that these state interests become stronger over the course of a pregnancy, the court resolved this balancing test by tying state regulation of abortion to the woman's current trimester of pregnancy. And we know that this remains a very contested area. In 1975, and I'm going to come back to Roe versus Wade in a minute, but two years after Roe versus Wade, there was another equality case that was very important. Stanton versus Stanton, and probably many of you will not have heard of this before, but this was the first time that the court declared unconstitutional a state law allowing a parent to stop supporting a daughter once she reached the age of 18 but requiring parental support for a son until he turned 21. And I remember actually being in high school and those of us talking about, can that really be different? And it was, but I thought that was fascinating. What I think is very, very interesting about these cases, and there's one other case that Justice Ginsburg litig litigated that was I'll just briefly describe, and that was a case in which a husband applied for benefits, social security benefits, to support his son after his wife died in childbirth. And he was denied social security benefits because the social security law at that time said that men did not need the additional support of the social security benefits as they would not be the ones caring for the child. This was, again, a Ruth Bader Ginsburg case, interestingly enough, and she won that case, and he was able to receive the Social Security benefits to support his son. 
Now, as we see these cases, starting with Reed versus Reed, Griswold versus Connecticut, Roe versus Wade, we have to ask ourselves, what is it that caused the court's understanding to dawn and to grow? Justice Ginsburg suggests that judges do read the newspapers, radical thought, and are effect, affected, she said, not by the weather of the day, as distinguished constitutional law professor Paul Freund once said, but by the climate of the era. Supreme Court justices and lower court judges as well were becoming aware of a sea change in United States society. Their enlightenment was advanced publicly by the briefs filed in court and privately by the aspirations of women, particularly, Justice Ginsburg suggests, the daughters and granddaughters in their own families and communities. And I actually remember having a fascinating conversation with Chief Justice Rehnquist about the significance of childcare. And he had suddenly discovered the lack thereof and the importance of it to a woman's career because his own daughter was struggling with childcare issues. And that was wonderful to have that conversation with him, proof of Justice Ginsburg's observation. In the years from 1961 to 1971, the year I graduated from high school, women's employment outside the home expanded rapidly. That expansion was attended by a revived women's equality movement, what some would refer to as the second wave. It was fueled in part by the movement in the 1960s for racial justice. There's a theme here, women's equality growing out of the abolition movement and then women's equality growing out of the 1960s struggle for racial equality. But it was also because of access to safer methods of birth control, longer lifespans, even inflation, all were implicated in a social dynamic that yielded this new reality. In the 1970s, for the first time in the nation's history, the average woman in the United States was experiencing most of her adult years in a household not dominated by childcare requirements. That development may indeed be, as Columbia University economics professor Eli Ginsburg described in 1977, quote, the single most outstanding phenomenon of the late 20th century. And here I just have an anecdote to tell about um, two things. One is that there was a companion case to Roe versus Wade. That was Doe versus Bolton. And it was brought out of Atlanta in Georgia. And it was actually brought by Toby Ann Schwartz, who was a graduate of the West Virginia <coughs> University College of Law in 1956, one of the few women. And some people have said that the case Doe versus Bolton was actually in some ways more important than Roe versus Wade. Um, so I thought that that was an interesting thing to share with you. I want to flip through a few of these slides to show you the struggle that continues with Roe versus Wade. And all of you are very familiar cartoon of engaged battle, and all of the kind of markers that we now see very often. One of the things that I want to talk about just for a minute in terms of birth control to put this in perspective is I want to tell a personal anecdote. And I feel like I hadn't included this in remarks, but since Patricia Proctor told us about her grandmother, I want to tell you about mine. My grandmother was Greek, didn't speak any English, and had 11 children. And um, in the mid-1960s, when the birth control pill was first uh, launched, my nine aunts were sitting around the kitchen table, and they were talking in English, and they were talking very animatedly. This is the family story, very excitedly. And um, of course, they were speaking in English so that my grandmother couldn't understand them because she was someone who they believed would be very anti-birth control. She was a very religious, orthodox woman. So finally, she said to them, oh, my daughters, you're obviously so excited about something. What is it? And she, the, one of my aunts got up the courage and said, well, Ma, they've invented this thing. And when you take it, you don't get pregnant. And then there was silence. And she smiled and she said, 
Oh, my daughters, if that had been available when I was your age, I would have eaten them like popcorn. <laughs> Which I think is a wonderful sort of closing moment for the struggle around birth control. Um, the erosion of the separate spheres, uh, as we've been seeing, led to a very famous 1982 case called Mississippi University for Women versus Hogan. And in that case, men were being excluded from attending a public nursing school. Um, and the court said that that was unconstitutional, that excluding qualified men from attending a nursing school tends to perpetuate the stereotyped view of nursing as exclusively a woman's job. When Justice O'Connor was in her first year as the first woman on the United States Supreme Court, she had the opportunity to write the decision, opening the University of Missis Mississippi University for Women to men. And she paved the way for the opinion that Justice Ginsburg wrote 14 years later in United States versus Virginia, which we know as the Virginia Military Academy case. Indicative of the power of precedent, Justice O'Connor wrote in 1982 for a court that divided 5-4, that was in Mississippi, the, vote, the court divided 5-4. The vote in 1996 in the Virginia Military Academy case was 7-1, with the Chief Justice writing a concurring opinion in support of the judgment. By forcing legislative and executive branch re-examination of sex-based classifications, the court helped to ensure that law and regulations would catch up with a changed world. Thus, Congress in the late 1970s opened the doors of the United States military academies, West Point, Annapolis, the Air Force Academy, all open to women. By June 26, 1966, when the court issued its opinion in the VMI case, there was, with only one dissenting opinion, it held that under the Constitution's equal protection principle, the Commonwealth of Virginia could not exclude from a public military college women who wished to attend and could meet the entrance requirements. The VMI decision by the time of the Virginia Military Academy case, women cadets had graduated at the top of every class at all of the US academies for over a decade. Now for the end of our story. To quote Justice Ginsburg, the evolution of the constitutional gender equality makes it possible for our daughters, as well as our sons, to aspire and achieve according to their individual talent and capacities. But as I mentioned earlier, we take this evolution of equality for granted at our peril. These are our new women judges. In 2011, Justice Scalia gave an interview published in California Lawyer Magazine, in which he says, which he said many times before, the Constitution does not protect against discrimination based on gender. Many people, many serious, honorable constitutional scholars agree with Justice Scalia. But put in the context of the fragility of gender equality in the Constitution, which I hope I've been able to convey to you tonight, if he is correct, and other constitutional scholars are correct as well, I leave you with this question. If the Constitution does not guarantee gender equality, is a constitutional amendment an equal rights amendment a necessity? Thank you very, very much for having me with you here this evening. I deeply appreciate it. Oh, sure. Yeah. Patricia said that we have time for questions, if there are any. Do you see any correlation between women's suffrage movement and prohibition? 
Oh, actually, there was quite a bit, and I was talking about it earlier today, uh, actually, because I, I was in an antique shop in Lewisburg, this was years ago, and I was looking at, a, you know, how they have those velvet boxes, and there was this pen, and it was a hatchet. And I said to the woman, what is this pen? And she said, oh, that was a symbol of Cary Nation, who was a very, very much a leader in the temperance movement. Um, and very involved in making sure there was prohibition. And um, I said, oh, how interesting. And we started talking about the connection between women's public political involvement in anti-slavery, which also came very much for many women from deep religious faith about how wrong it was, to the temperance movement, which also for many came out of religious faith, but also came out of a kind of endangerment that they saw to women and children with violent alcoholic men. And so the, the movement of, of anti-slavery, temperance, and then the equality movement in, you know, leading up to 1923 to the first ERA, very much, if you look at that historically, you'll see many of the characters, many of the women as public figures overlapping. And it's really a fascinating history. Well, thank you for asking that question. That's a great question. Yes? Yes, it's very interesting. There were two, this often happens in Supreme Court cases, and if you're a lawyer, excuse me, and, and you probably would already know this, but if you're not, I'll explain it for everyone else in the audience who may not be. There are often cases that find their way to the Supreme Court simultaneously, raising the same issues. And in this case, there was Roe versus Wade, which is coming out of Texas, and Doe versus Bolton that was coming out of Georgia, both um, involving the right to of women to um, terminate pregnancies. And I really, there, there's not as much written about Doe as there is about Roe, and I don't know why some, and I hate to admit the ignorance, but it, I did not know until I started this research for this presentation that it was a WVU graduate who had actually brought Doe versus Bolton, and we started going through the archives and we discovered it. And we're trying to figure out, we think she's living in California, and we're going to try to find her. Um, but I'm sorry, and when I do more research, I'll fill you in. Yes? Well, it, it came out of Congress, and it went to the states, and it um, originally had an arbitrary deadline set on it of seven years. And in the seven years, it was not ratified by enough states. And so it was extended by three years, so it had a decade. Um, but in the end, in 1982, it, did, it, it fell short by three states. Um, and I don't know what would happen now. There are women who reintroduce it almost every session of Congress. Um, and I truly, when I said there are wonderful, very, very thoughtful, honorable scholars that agree with Justice Scalia about the fact that the Constitution does not protect the equal rights of women, um, if that is true, then there is a very strong argument, I think, for an equal rights amendment, um, very similar to what we saw at, at, in 1868 with the 14th Amendment. So it's, it, it's, a, it's a very interesting, it, even though perhaps we might assume that someone like Justice Scalia with Justice Scalia's position might be against an equal rights amendment, he might actually in fact say that's exactly what we need to do because the Constitution is silent. And that, that he might find that a more legitimate way of achieving equal protection based, based on gender. Are there other questions? I'd be happy to answer any. Probably everyone is hungry and wants to go eat. Yes? How many feminists are waves? Because there were, how many feminist waves are there that you're talking about? You said that there was a second one. Oh, waves of, of um, well, usually um, historians will say that there were two 
women's rights waves, or two waves of fights, struggles for women's equality. And they usually say, um, they usually will start the first one about 1868 with the 14th Amendment up through the um, time of the right to vote and the introduction of the Equal Rights Amendment. And then it tapers off. And then they usually say the second wave began either in the late 50s or early 60s, depending on, on which historian you're, you're interested in following. But right there at about the same time that birth control was becoming more widely available and um, civil rights on the basis of um, to end discrimination on the basis of race was converging at that point. And I just I think it's fascinating just historically that the two waves are also associated with ending racial discrimination, one with ending slavery and the other with civil rights in the 60s. Uh, I'm also an undergrad, so I'm going to answer this completely wrong. But I heard a lot of argument about um, a third wave, like allowing women to have the I, well, I think that's great. I think there might be 50 waves if we actually um, drill down and, and look at all of the ways in which women have been struggling to simply, as Justice Ginsburg would say, simply to be treated as human. Um, because that's what involves the choice. And I think a lot of people would say that there's a third wave of choice. Um, other people would say, and scholars in particular will say, where we are sort of post feminist, that we no longer need a movement for women's rights. Um, I think that, uh, I, as you can probably tell from my presentation this evening, I'm not convinced of that argument, uh, but I know that that is something that p other people consider another wave as well. Other questions? Yes. I don't know. It's a it's a great question. I doubt it. Um, I doubt it. What? Why do you think so? Well, I think in the seventies they just found more they expanded privacy rights and everything else. Just they were fine. That right applied constitutionally to all equal rights. The same rights for everybody else. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, that's interesting. Uh huh. I think they perceived it that they had to win it. And, and well, that's true. Well, that's really interesting because there is some literature, if you look back at some of the writings of Elizabeth Cady Stanton and um, Susan B. Anthony at the time, they did believe that they had it, but they also believed that they had to win it because they weren't being. That it wasn't being recognized, and so that's a, I think that's a very good point. Adds some complexity. I, I appreciate that. Maybe they would have found that women had the right to vote. I just don't know. Um, I don't know what the evolution would have been, and I don't know how long it would have taken, um, which is a, another issue. I mean, it, it is somewhat extraordinary to think that, for example, West Virginia found it unconstitutional to to exclude African American men from juries in 1880, but it took until 19, uh, till 1956 in West Virginia and 1970 um, for, the, for the Supreme Court to, to hold that. And one of the things that's difficult to know, if, if women didn't have the right to vote, if women weren't more full participants in public life, would have happened in between, and I don't know. Other questions? Well, I want to tell you how much I really enjoyed being here this evening, and it really, what I said at the very beginning, I should repeat, it is truly a great honor to be included with the list of, of great people who have stood at this podium, and I know you'll have a wonderful, wonderful lecture series next year as well. So thank you very, very much for having me. Thank you, Dean McConnell, for coming. We're honored, we're delighted. You've given us a wonderful evening, and we'd like to give you this small gift of 
Huntington and Marshall specific kinds of things. So. I got I got <laughs> pinned with a Marshall yeah. pin. So. so thank you for coming. And uh, she's correct. We will have a lecture series next year. It's already lined up. So please have that in the back of your mind. It will resume in the end of September. And uh, you'll be receiving information about it in plenty of time to put it in your calendar. We look forward to seeing you next year. And thank you for your support this year. Thank you.